All right. If you got a Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, we're going to be in the book of Hosea again. Hosea chapter 12 is where we're going to begin. I was in the, the pool on Tuesday this week with all three of my kids. And Evie, my little girl, my only girl, five years old, she's daddy's girl. She loves me. And so when I'm in the pool, she typically hangs all over me. And she was doing that. And she began to notice things about me. And she said, uh, Daddy, why do you have all that white coming in your beard now? Uh, she's like petting my beard. And I'm like, well, baby girl, like, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. She's like, what's a spring chicken? I'm like, I'm not a kid anymore. Um, you know, this just happens when people get a little bit older. They start sprouting some gray and white hairs, you know. And, um, and some people will deceive you because they'll dye it. But, hey, I'm not going to deceive you, baby girl. And, uh, and so she's like, <laughs> I'm just kidding, by the way. And, uh, and so she's uh. She's like, okay, are you about to die? And I'm like, no, I hope not. Um, but, uh, but I am getting just a little bit older. And so she's like, okay, okay. And so we're swimming for a few minutes, about five, 10 minutes later. I'm like, well, okay, I gotta go. I gotta go back to church because we have um, the collective tonight. She's like, what's the collective? And I'm like, it's a young adult gathering. She's like, well, you're old. Why are you going to that, okay? And I'm like, thank you for the reminder. Uh, it just, quite honestly, it was a reminder of my eldership in the church, but also as a reminder that kids make the best mirrors, right? Uh, if you want an honest perspective on your life, don't get like one of those hotel mirrors that blots out the blemishes or anything, and don't ask somebody who's just uh, <laughs> there to kind of stroke your ego, ask your kids, or ask your wife after you've been married for more than a year, okay, <laughs> uh, twin, uh, ask, your, ask them like the honest truth, and what you're going to hear back from them is oftentimes a very brutal, very honest perspective from children. And that perspective, that truth is not necessarily bad. They might point out the obvious, but we need to be reminded of the obvious. We've been here in the book of Hosea now for almost three months. And it is a really an epic, a heavy tale and prophecy, a lot of poetry throughout it, of this young prophet, at least he's young in the early days of the penning of the book, who the Lord calls, Hosea is his name, the Lord calls Hosea to marry a prostitute, uh, to go into the red light district and to find this seedy lady and to marry her and to have children by her, and then she's going to run off into her prostitution again. And the whole purpose for this scandalous tale is to show that the Lord has done this for his people, that the Lord has pursued a wayward, unfaithful, adulterous people, and that even when he has redeemed them, they run back oftentimes to their unfaithfulness, to their spiritual prostitution. And just as Gomer is shattering the heart, Gomer being Hosea's wife, is shattering the heart of Hosea again and again and again, so God's people essentially shatter his hearts, grieve his soul through their treachery and their waywardness and their betrayal. So that story was set up for us. And then kind of following the first three chapters of the story, Hosea, through this prophetic poetry, begins to just lay out on repeat over and over and over again a divine, brutal, truthful mirror to our lives. And we don't like that mirror because it's accurate. We like pretense. We like smoke mirrors. We like fraudulence, if I'm honest. I do anyway. I want to think better of myself than what I am. We want to think better of ourselves than what we are. Our social media account proves that. And yet Hosea just again and again reminds us of the sin, even as God's covenant people, the sin that remains in our lives. And last week, our head broke the surface of the water, so to speak, as we saw in Hosea chapter 11, with just this remarkable declaration of the steadfast, unconditional, unrelenting love of the Lord for us, his people. And next week, we're going to hear the final plea of the Lord, come back to me. But for now, sandwiched between the radical love of the Lord and the relentless pursuit of the Lord, we find one last mirror for the soul in the book of Hosea. And it is contained here in two chapters. Yes, two chapters. It usually takes us about 45 minutes to get through one. So buckle up this morning for an hour and a half of study. Yeah, that'd be great, right? For me, intro. 
The rest of you, I don't know. But anyway, um, we're gonna, no, it will not be an hour and a half, but we're going to start here in chapter 12. And just like we've done every week, we're still walk verse by verse, verse and see what the Lord is saying to us. So chapter 12, verse 1, here's the mirror. Ephraim, once again, as we've designated every week, another name for Israel, nation of Israel, supposed to be the covenant people of God. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all the day long. So the picture there is literally of someone not just chasing what the wind is blowing, like as if their hat has fallen off or some trash is sweeping across the parking lot. But the picture is of someone frantically chasing the wind itself. Like if we saw this, what would we do? We would say, we might laugh, we might record on our phones, but then we would say to the person, if we cared at all, hey, you're never going to catch that. You're never going to pin down the wind. You can't do it. And yet he's saying, Ephraim continues to chase after that which they can never catch. The, that, that which is temporal. They're trying to satisfy the deepest needs of their souls through that which is fleeting, like waves crashing up on the seashore and then they're gone, like clouds moving in the heavens. That's the picture here. Transience has become their satisfaction. They multiply falsehood and violence. So we see that throughout history. We've seen it in our day. That what happens when someone is offended, when someone is upset, oftentimes the truth doesn't back their claims. And so they'll spread lies. We saw that even with Roe v. Wade in the last couple of weeks. Lies spread everywhere. And what does it do? It breeds violence. And that's what lies do. And this was happening in the nation of Israel. They multiply falsehood and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria. Assyria is a superpower to the east. They make a covenant with them, an alliance, a treaty to maintain peace, to maintain their borders, to maintain some semblance of independence, at least in their mind. And oil is carried to Egypt, the other superpower. Egypt being the, the country, the nation of slavery they were delivered from 500 years prior. Assyria being the nation that they're about to be delivered to in captivity. He's been warning them of that. Chapter 12, verse 2. Yahweh has an indictment, a criticism. We hear a lot of criticism in our day, outside the church, inside the church. But when Yahweh has a criticism, we pay attention. He's not trite or flippant. He's not fallacious with his criticism. He has a criticism against Judah. That's the southern kingdom. So Judah's not completely walking in faithfulness, as we saw at the end of chapter 11, he has a criticism and indictment against them and will punish Jacob. That's another name for Ephraim or Israel, northern kingdom again. Will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. And so we stop here for a second because the, the idea that's being communicated to us is that the people are shifting around. They're chasing after the wind. They're chasing after the pleasures of this life. And in their chasing after these things, they're being uh, unethical, lacking in integrity, dishonest, and they're breeding violence. And so we as the church have to stop here and realize that this is God's word delivered to us, yes, 2,700 years ago, but it's very, very relevant in power to today. And we asked ourselves, are we guilty of this? Or am I guilty of this? Are you guilty of this? Is the church in general in America guilty of this? We talked about it a couple weeks ago. But the lies, the defamation of God is what I would call it. Through song, through Bible study, there's some good stuff on Right Now Media, there's some really terrible stuff. There's some good stuff in the Christian books, there's some really terrible stuff. We have to be incredibly careful. We cannot afford to lie about God. Right. We cannot afford to say things about him that are not true. What happens is this, this past week in our, our final study, we're doing a Bible study of the doctrines of salvation. And so we we're down to Edwin and a question came in, anonymous question. Uh, do Christians normally doubt the existence of God? Like, can, can a Christian do that? Does a Christian do that? I, I love the question because I found in it honesty. I'm struggling here. I'm struggling to believe for one reason or another. And so I responded with, you know, just saying, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the honesty and vulnerability of it. But I would challenge the one asking that, or maybe if you're feeling that, you're unwilling to say it because after all we live in, just south of the Bible belts, and we go to a Reformed church, Bible-believing church, and so we're like, man, I can't like, admit that I might be struggling with, does, is God really there? Does God really care? So what I challenge them with, and I'll challenge you with, is this, and I've been challenging my own soul with this. 
Let's make sure that the God we're doubting is the God biblically defined in Scripture. Because oftentimes what we do in our culture and society, I've seen this historically as well, is we kind of concoct this God from the norms of Christianese culture, and we say this is who God is supposed to be, this is how he's supposed to move, this is how he's supposed to care. And then when he doesn't move in the way that we think he should move, or he doesn't care in the way that we think he should care about what we think he should care about, our tendency is to deny him. And yet the Lord is saying, that's never who I said I am. So we need to stop lying to our souls. We need to stop lying to our families. We need to stop lying to other people about who God is and start portraying him as who he actually is. The nation of Israel, the priest of Israel, were not taking this charge seriously. So the Lord has an indictment against them. Verse three, in the womb, he's talking about the Genesis account of Jacob here. Esau and Jacob, the twin sons of Isaac, grandsons of Abraham. In the womb, Jacob took his brother by the heel. And so if you remember the story there, Esau, they're twins. So Esau pops out first, little Ewok Esau, um, covered in hair. And then uh, so hairy, they name him Harry, like we talked about, that's what Esau means. And then Jacob, smooth, uh, comes out. And it's almost like they can see who he's going to be. And so they name him deceiver or usurper or supplanter. That's literally his name. And he comes out, he takes his brother by the heel as the deceiver. And then in manhood, he grows up and he strove with God. So he battled the Lord because he's an achiever after all. I can do it all myself. And so verse four, he strove with the angel and humanly speaking, he prevailed. And then he realized in his victory that no amount of strength, we see this in Romans nine, talking about the story, no amount of strength or willpower or force can actually procure for me the favor or the grace of God. And so he strove with the angel and prevailed, and then he wept and sought his favor. He met God at Bethel. It was named Bethel, house of the Lord. Yahweh, the God of hosts, verse five. Yahweh is his memorial name. That's his covenantal name. What it's doing is it's, tossing the Israelites' perspective backwards again to how God delivered Jacob and how God delivered Abraham and how God delivered the people of Israel in the Exodus through the sea from Pharaoh. It's his memorial name. While you change, I do not change. There is surety and safety and security in his name. There is steadfast love in his name. This is the sacred name of God. We see Lord, all capital letters. We've talked about this. I'll remind you, it's not a title for him. It's a name, his covenant name, Yahweh, God of hosts. Yahweh is his memorial name. So you can trust it. There are people, we hear their name. And instantly there are pretty radical feelings of mistrust. Because the name, at least in our day to some extent, captures the essence of the individual, the character of the individual. Well, Yahweh captured the essence and the character and the identity of God himself. And so when the people hear Yahweh, they should be able to remember he has been faithful, therefore he will be faithful. So you, verse six, by the help of your God, even though you've been wayward, even though you've been deceitful, even though you've been self-sovereign, you've been self-centered, by the help of your God, return. That's a word that we see in various forms in the Hebrew, 25 times in the 14 chapters of Hosea, God just relentlessly saying to you, come back, return to me, repent, hold fast to love, hold fast to justice, to ideas in our day, and I would say throughout history that seem to be in contradiction to each other. Nationally, religiously, even politically, we see this. One party will stand for love. One party will stand for justice. One person will stand for love. One person will stand for justice. And yet he says, you, my people, love true love and love true justice. And wait continually for your God. We're impatient, I think. We want the fast payoff. We've been acclimated to that. They were impatient then, 2,700 years ago. So he says, wait on the Lord. You don't need to be like Jacob, fighting for it, trying to achieve, wait on the Lord. A merchant in whose hands are false balances, he loves to oppress, so he compares the nation of Israel to shady businessmen here. 
false balances, loving to oppress. Ephraim has said, ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself. So what Ephraim, what Israel's doing here is they're saying, look at what we have. Look at our prosperity. Look at our success. Look at our homes. Look at our palaces. This is clearly a manifestation of the favor of God upon us. And people are still doing that today, grossly. He says, Ephraim says, I'm rich. I found wealth for myself. And all my labors, they cannot find me in me iniquity or sin. Like, check out my life. You're not going to find any transgression there. It's a dangerous declaration to make. They're playing the game pretty well. It's this hyper, over-the-top, fraudulent Christianity that we even see in our day, pretending that we don't struggle. Um, I, we've said oftentimes, it's okay to not be okay. Like, it's okay to admit that. There's a struggle. There's a sin pattern. There's, it's okay. Like, I mean, the admittance of that, we should admit that. We should say that. And then we should return to the Lord from that. Verse 9, I am Yahweh your God. From the land or since the land, out of the land of Egypt, the same God unchanging, I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feast. And so what happened was they're brought out of Egypt and there's these different feasts, memorials, or holidays that are observed in the nation of Israel. And one of them, the last festival of the year during the harvest season was the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And what would happen in this day, in the day of Hosea, they're living in the land of Canaan, is during this festival, they would leave their homes, they would actually go out into the wilderness, so to speak, and they would tent, they would camp again in these little booths that they would construct. And it wasn't that much fun, but it was the most, it was the festival associated with the most intense rejoicing in the nation of Israel, because it was a picture, it was a reminder to them that God had delivered them from all of their wanderings and had placed them, had given them a home had given them refuge, had given them a land, had given them his blessing. And he says, no, I'm going to displace you again. Like Instead of just going out for a week to celebrate my goodness, you're going to be displaced because of your sin. Verse 10, I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied visions and through the prophets gave parables. So he's saying, I'm the one who gave you my word. Remember, they didn't have, obviously, the completed canon of scripture, like sacred scripture in their day. They basically just had the Torah at this point in time. And so he spoke to them by prophets, multiplied visions, and through the prophets gave parables. And yes, God, in case you're wondering, God does speak today, but not in the same way that he spoke then through his prophets, not an inspired way, truly inspired for his people. And so he says, I spoke, you knew the truth, you knew my word, and we know his word, and therefore we understand if there's iniquity, and if there is iniquity in Gilead, they shall surely come to nothing. There's gonna be consequence for that. In Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Their altars also are like stone heaps on the furrows of the field. So basically what he's saying is this, your church building, this is how I would compare your church building, is like, um, it's like a bunch of rocks in a field that we want to cultivate. It's just annoying. We need to tear it apart. We need to move it. We need to get rid of it. That's your altars, Israel. The places where you would go for worship are just like rocks in a field. Jacob fled from the land of Aram. He returns to this again. There Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he guarded sheep. Basically, he's laying out the consequences of Jacob's deceit here, how he had to be displaced from his home, how he had to slave away under his future father-in-law. Doesn't get worse than that. By a prophet, Yahweh brought Israel up from Egypt, pardon me, and by a prophet he was guarded. So the Lord's hand was there, delivering his people, even though they were not faithful then. Ephraim, or Israel, has given bitter provocation in response to this deliverance. So his Lord, different, that's Adonai, not all caps there, that's his master, or his creator, will leave his blood guilt on him. The judge will leave his blood guilt on him and will repay him for his disgraceful deeds. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. Why was he trembling? He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. So even though his life seems to be going pretty well, and even though he's still attending worship, and even though he's still singing the songs and memorizing the verses and serving in kids' ministry, which is awesome. I'm so glad you're doing this. It's awesome. It's right there in the text. You see it. But, but, uh, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. Why? Because it's false piety. It's not genuine. And he's still submitting himself to Baal, the Canaanite god. 
And now they send more and more, make for themselves metal images, idols skillfully made of their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of them, those who offer human sacrifice kiss calves. And so the idea here is the goldsmith or the stone, the mason, they'll, what they'll do is they'll, they'll create, they'll craft this statue. And he's, it's almost like saying, don't you realize how pointless this is? You made this thing. I mean, you're worshiping this thing as if it's a god, but you made this thing. Therefore, they shall be like the morning mist or like the dew that goes early away. Their satisfaction will be very short-lived. Like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor, like smoke from a window. But I am Yahweh, your God. I remain, I am steadfast, recurring theme here. From the land of Egypt, you know no God but me. And besides me, there is no Savior, including yourself. You can't do it. You can't do it. No one else can do it for you. There's no Savior. I'm the only Savior. I am the only God. It was I who knew you in the wilderness. That is an intimate term, even a a, a sexual term between a man and a wife throughout the Hebrew Old Testament. So God intimately encountered his people as he does us today in the land of drought. I provided for you. I would, my presence was there with you. I cared deeply for you. But when they had grazed, watch what happens. When they had grazed, so you were starving to death. You were thirsting to death, but I gave you water. I gave you manna. And when you had eaten, they became full and they were filled and their heart was lifted up and therefore they forgot me. So I am to them like a lion. I'm like a leopard. I will lurk beside the way. What does that mean, Lord? Verse eight, I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast and there I will devour them like a lion as a wild beast would rip them open. God, you need to calm down a little bit. You're overreacting to this. This is not culturally sensitive. This doesn't line up with the God that I believe in. Maybe that's why we doubt the God that we believe in. It's not the biblical God. There is a, and there was radical, almost uncomfortable love displayed last week. So some here are like, oh my gosh, like if you tell people God loves them that much, like what are they gonna do? Now there is this radical, ruthless savagery that's communicated. Like God, I don't remember who said it, probably many people, but God is far more wild than you could ever imagine in our human vernacular, and God is far more tame than we could ever imagine at the same time. He's far more loving, far more gracious, and he is far more ruthless as the judge. Verse nine, he brings this destruction. He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper, Where now is your king to save you in all of your cities? (laughs) That's cute that you thought your military or that your fortresses or that your king, your governors would protect you. Where are they at now? Where are all your rulers, those of whom you said, give me a king and princess? I gave you a king in my anger. Now, this is not like a volatile, off-the-cuff anger that we would be associated with in humanity or from our own lives. Um, This is a fixed condemnation of evil. And the Lord in the book of Judges had delivered his people into the land of Canaan. And he has said to them, I will be your king. I will be a sovereign who demonstrates kindness and grace to my people. And how did the people of Israel respond? Oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much. No, we want a king we can see. We want a king king we can control, that we can bully. And so God says, in my anger, in my wrath, in judgment, I gave you a king. And in my judgment or in my wrath, again, I took him away, verse 11. Verse 12, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. Like this is, this is pretty pressing upon us, pretty telling, because the idea here is that um, the people of Israel kept sinning, and because there was no immediate judgment, they kept thinking they were getting away with it. He's like, no, it's stored up. 
His sins kept in store. The pains of childbirth come for him, but he is a stupid or unwise son for at the right time, he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. What is he doing here? He's drawn on the analogy from Genesis chapter three of pain and childbirth. And he's saying, okay, because of sin, pain will be associated with childbirth. But when the pain comes, when the contractions start, when the water breaks, the baby's about to arrive. And he's saying, look, all the warning signs are there for you, Israel. The pain of judgment is descending upon you. And yet still, you will not present yourself before the Lord. You will not return to him. So it's, it, it's a lot of heaviness, again, a lot of judgment, a lot of uh, spiritual scourging. And then verse 14, shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? And look, if we're paying attention at all this morning with Hosea, we're like, no. Like these people are jacked up. These people are wicked. They're terrible. Don't, no, don't rescue them from the power of Sheol. Sheol is just that, Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word Hades. It could mean generally the place of the dead, but typically it's more specifically designated as the place of destruction or condemnation. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? And Hosea's like, no, please don't. They deserve this, including my wife, including Gomer. Shall I redeem them from death? Because death is what they deserve. Damnation and destruction is what they deserve. Shall I bring them back from this, even this? And the answer, shockingly, not to us, because we're just, we're Westerners. So we're like, we love love and compassion and mercy. Really a fraudulent view of it oftentimes. But for anybody else throughout history and even in the world today, this is shocking. It's like, shall, these people are terrible. They're rebellious. They're wayward. They're unfaithful. They've committed cosmic treason against me. Should I redeem them from death? No. No, that would be a compromise of justice. Shall I bring them back from destruction? No. And yet the answer is yes. Oh, death, where are your plagues? I mean, death, you said that you would bring with you pestilence. It's the same word used in Exodus chapter 9 when the pestilence is unleashed by God's judgment upon Egypt. But where, where is this pestilence? Where are these plagues? Oh, Sheol, where is your sting? I thought it was going to be worse than this. Compassion is hidden from, or it could be in my eyes. So hidden from, we, we get that old antiquated terminology. It doesn't mean remove from, but it means in, behind, or with. This compassion is demonstrated even though you can't see it. It's like the Puritans would say, behind this frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. And then it says this, verse 15, though he may flourish among his brothers, while all seems well now, everything's good to go, the east wind, the judgment of the Lord, the wind of the Lord shall come rising from the wilderness and his fountain shall dry up, his spring shall be parched, it shall strip his treasury of every precious thing. Samaria, capital city again of the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God, they shall fall by the sword, their little ones shall be dashed in pieces, and their pregnant women ripped open. That's what's going to happen when Assyria comes. That's what your sin has done, Israel. And in many ways, this is what our sin is doing, even as his people. So four themes really rise up quickly from the text this morning. Four themes I want us to see from chapters 12 and 13. The first theme, very clearly, is the rebellion of the people. It's rebellion. Rebellion is the clear establishment of what is right and then the refusal to submit to or obey that which is right. That's rebellion. This is why God has compared his people over and over again to a whore because it doesn't get more dark or sinister than that. He says, I've established, you knew my words, I gave you the prophets, and yet you ran after your own desires. We see that actually really clearly in chapter 12, verse one, when he says, they feed, you feed on the wind. And maybe this is not you, maybe you're walking submitted to the Lord, but for some of us, I think this is the American way of life. Like what's going to make me happy today? What's going to satisfy me now in this moment with no thought for tomorrow, with no thought for eternity? And he says, this is the rebellion of the heart. I have called you to be a people with an eternal scope a people that value ultimate redemption, a people that value spirituality far more than physicality. And yet it's all about what's gonna make me feel great now. 
And we even see this in the church. Right? A religion that says to us, do what you want, do what makes you happy. I'm going to give you some tips to help you along the way to become a better version of yourself. And he said, that's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not about this momentary, fleeting, fraudulent satisfaction that, hey, I'm happy today because my sports team won, or I'm happy today because they got to sleep with this hot girl, or I'm happy today because um, the, the idols in my life have satisfied whatever longings I have. But that happiness is fraudulent. It is smoke. It is fleeting. He says that here in the text. It's just going to fade away. It doesn't sound, anybody can tell you that. Like, look at Hugh Hefner. Did he live a truly satisfied life? Some of us are like, well, yeah, I'll, you know, I, I would like that life. That'd be great. Because we didn't live it. It's a lie. It's a sham. It really is. You study all the philosophy, even non-Christian philosophy. That is not the way to true joy and happiness. It's just fulfilling whatever is momentary in my life. That's not it. Just living for today, living for the weekend, living for the next vacation, living for the boat, living for the new car. Ecclesiastes, as we saw a couple years ago, calls us repeatedly away from that. But that's the rebellion of the heart of God's people, where God says, man, I've delivered you. I am your God. I'm present with you. I truly care about you. All these people, all these things, all these idols that are saying they're going to care about you, Hollywood doesn't care about you. They care about your money. Like, Washington doesn't care about you. They care about your power, and they care about greed. Like, the people that we meet in our lives, they care about what they can get from us. But God says, I'm not caring necessarily first and foremost about what I can get from you, I care about what I can do for you. Like, that's, that's beyond today. That's beyond today. And I, just, I wish that we could get this. I wish that I could get it because I suck at this. Like, today becomes, man, what, what's going to make me happy now instead of a legacy I can leave behind for my kids, instead of proclaiming the truth when it's unpopular, instead of living for him. So there's this radical rebellion on the part of the Israelites, and you see it really in fivefold. I'll run through these really quick because we're running out of time. But number one, uh, the first thing you see here from the text in chapter 12, verse 1, is this self-indulgence, this indulgence that is there. It's all about me. It's all about my needs. I'll even serve others so it will come back to me. I'll put them in my debts. So there's that indulgence. They chase after the wind. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Tell the people to stop doing that. They'll never catch the wind. Indulgence is not the way that God designed us to live, especially as his redeemed people. Number two is independence. So there's this indulgence, self-indulgence. Number two is independence, self-sovereignty, that I'm my own master. I do what I want. And what I'll do is I'll curate what God says according to, so I'll still believe the Bible, but I'll believe it according to what makes me happy. I'll twist it so that it's all about me. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of Osteen this bad boy or this fur this bad boy, so to speak, like Joyce Meyer, this bad boy. Like, I'll just take it and I'll go, hey, you know what? This is just all about me. Like, it's just all about me. Like, it's not really about God. It's about what God is, is doing um, secondarily for me. And he says, this is an indictment that I have. <laughs> You're not in control. I mean, this is so stupid. Like, uh, we've talked, we talk a lot on staff about just the stupidity of ourselves and about humanity and about Christians. Because it's like, like, if we just stop for even five seconds, we can acknowledge that we're not in control. Like we're not independent. We depend on something else for whether it's God or whatever we want to believe. We depend on something else for the very next breath that we're going to breathe. We depend on a whole lot of things working together to watch the football game. To, to put food on the table. Well, I work, I put food on the table. Really, it's more complex than that. And so it's not, I'm not fully independent. I'm not self-sovereign. I didn't choose to get melanoma. I didn't choose to have a child with a heart defect. I, I would never have chosen those things. There is evidence that I'm not in control. I'm not truly independent. But the people of Israel felt like they were. Then number three, we saw this again and they were insincere. So they're coming like shady businessmen. It's all about themselves. So it seems like they're worshiping the Lord. Look at me, you can't find any iniquity in me, no sin, but they're insincere. Number four, a theme we've seen again and again is idolatry. Chapter 13, verse one, they come to the Baals to offer up worship to them, serving their gods, their making. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. And then finally, and we really haven't talked about this in the book of Hosea. It's probably the thing that gripped me the most this week is the idleness. What does the Lord say? He says, I came to you in Egypt. 
Ultimately, you went to Egypt following Joseph because you thought that Egypt could provide. And they did, physically speaking, for a time. And then a pharaoh rose who did not know the Lord, essentially thought he was the Lord. And he enslaved you. Do you remember how rough that was? I know it's been 500 years, but do you remember how terrible that was, that slavery? I know you have a tendency to forget, but it was awful. Your children were starving. Your little boys were being thrown to the crocodiles in the Nile. You were doing backbreaking work every day. You couldn't even rest on the Sabbath. And I came to you in your desperation. And I saved you. And it wasn't like a bargain. It wasn't like, hey, what can you do for me if I save you? It was like, you can't do anything. You're a broken, destitute people. And I came to you by my sovereign power. And I unleashed that power in the face of evil. And I unleashed that power to bring about deliverance. And I led you out of the wilderness. And you are my people now. You are my home. You are my family. You are the blessed of God. And what's happened? But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled in their hearts, lifted up, and they forgot me. So that's why we talk oftentimes about pain and suffering. As much as, as hard as it is, as much as we don't like it, it's a wake-up call to our souls. As Lewis would say, it's a megaphone to rouse a sleeping world. Because what happens is we get comfortable. God has come to us. Uh, the Exodus, as brilliant and miraculous as it was physically for God's national people, Israel, 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago is, is so much, like, it's just a picture. I mean, it was, it was a literal thing that truly happened historically, but it's just a picture of a far greater deliverance where the Lord comes to all of us, his people, in brokenness, in desperation, in destitution, dead in trespass and sins, and the Lord redeems us out. He brings us back from Sheol. Like, he saves us, he saved us, and he didn't save us just to go on vacation. He didn't save us just to be consumers. Like, he just didn't. It's not a guilt trip this morning. It's just a wake-up call for us. Like, you were saved. You were redeemed for more than just comforts and spiritual apathy. And so that's what he's saying to the nation of Israel here. That's the rebellion. A the second theme, really quick, is retribution. Because we see the decay all around, especially outside of ourselves. I have a harder time seeing it within than in other people right? This is how we are wired. That's a mark of our depravity. But like, what we don't see oftentimes is we think we're kind of getting away with it. We think the world is getting away with it. God, will you please act against those people? They're terrible. And why don't you just delay that activity from me and be merciful? And, uh, and yet the Lord says, there's retribution coming. I've been warning you of this for 20 years, he says in the book of Hosea. But this retribution is coming. We used to have a staff member here. Love the guy. Great, great, funny kid. Um, and he would come in uh, this was four or five years ago now, he would come in uh, on Tuesdays or Wednesdays complaining. Uh, it happened like within a couple of weeks of him coming here. He's like, I was coming down this frontage road and there was a police officer sitting over here by Ford's garage and he pulled me over and he gave me a ticket. Oh yeah, that happens, man. You gotta be careful whipping around, coming down that frontage road, you gotta be careful. And then like, I'm not kidding you, the next week he comes in, I can't believe this. I was coming down the frontage road right here and got pulled over and got a ticket again. And at that point, we're like, yeah, you might want to slow down. <laughs> and I'm not even exaggerating. Maddie asked me the other night, she's like, who is, who is that staff member? And before I could even answer, Jeffrey answered. He knew. Like two weeks later, he gets another ticket right here on the frontage road. It's almost like he just keeps driving, keeps you know, breaking the speed limit with no thought to retribution. And the Lord says, this is how the people of Israel are acting. Like you're, you're living, or maybe this is how my people today are acting. Like as a matter of fact, I was reading a commentator this week because it talks about this lion or this leopard or this bear who rips apart. And that makes us super uncomfortable as we acknowledged. And the commentator said this, listen close. He says, to hear God described as beastly in his brutality, devouring human flesh like a vicious carnivore, it's jolting. The purpose of such a description is to cut through the foggy notion of an indulgent God that their theology and ritual had given them and so awaken the audience to the reality of divine fury. If you hear that and you're paying attention, I think we can acknowledge together 
that we need that. Our religion and our ritual has presented to us this foggy notion of an indulgent God. He says, no, that's, that's, not, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. There will be divine consequence, judgment, not full and final. We've talked about this, but in case you're new with us, not, I mean, we're not talking about a loss of salvation or an alienation from God's family if they're truly his family. But even for his kids, there is divine chastisements and discipline and punishment that comes so there's retribution. A third theme that we see here is, again, reconciliation. And like I said, we saw, we've seen this 25 times in the book of Hosea where he says, come back to me. We see it most expressly there in verse 6 of chapter 12. So you, by the help of your God, I love that that he includes that phrase. Because he doesn't just say, hey, you, buck up. Do the right thing, hold fast. But he says, hey, you, just a reminder, by the graciousness of your God, because grace doesn't only qualify us, which is miraculous, grace empowers us. So by the help of your God, return, hold fast, hold fast to truth, to love and justice as I define love and justice, and wait, wait, something we are terrible at, wait continually for your God. So this is what it means as his people to be reconciled back to him We've drifted, we become apathetic. What does he call us to? Come back, repent, hold fast to your confession truth, and wait. Now here they're waiting for this renewal, for the Spirit of God to move as we do, but ultimately they're waiting for a fourth theme that we see here. There's rebellion leading to retribution, there's a call back to reconciliation, but finally there's resurrection here in this text. So in the midst of all this brutality and savagery and darkness, there's just a ton of hope that will lead us into next week. And we heard it, right? We heard it in the, in the text. So when we got together as a media team to create um, the media package, so to speak, for this series. So our goal, whether it works or not for you, our goal is when we create the, the visuals and we create the video together, and come up with it, is to communicate the truth of the passage, the themes, these divine themes, these beautiful themes that God is communicating to us through the book of Hosea. And so we sat down and we came up with the idea of these beautiful flowers and how they wilt and how they die and how they're tossed out and someone goes to the garbage heap and plucks them out and puts them on display again because essentially here we are, the beautiful flowers created in the image of God. God, so this, this is radical for us if we really stop to think about it, but God looked at us and he looked at this world and what did God say? Good. I did a good job. This is good. Now we look around and we're like, no, it's not, but that's because of sin. And because of sin, there has been a wilting. There has been a corruption that takes place. There has been a death. There is depravity. There is corruption. And we are destined for the trash heap, so to speak. We're destined for this destruction. And yet God, by radical grace, comes to us not when we were blooming and beautiful, but when we were diseased and rotted. And he comes to us and he lifts us out by his saving grace and he demonstrates his love for us and he puts us on display as we talked about as trophies of his grace. So that's radical. That is a scandalous love. We wouldn't do that. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I brought my wife home dead flowers, there'd be consequences for that. We don't buy dead flowers we don't save dead flowers. We don't display dead flowers. Only God does that, okay? But he doesn't. The theme, C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Weight of Glory, he said, the New Testament, every page of the New Testament rustles with the message that it will not always be this way. And I would go further than that and say, even though the Old Testament is tough and it's dark and it's heavy, and the sin of the people, the idolatry of the people is on display a lot. All the pages of the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, rustle with the same message. That this destruction we see, even this wilting. So the video is incomplete. Because what, what the video is portraying for us is that God comes to us like Hosea went to Gomer. And he redeems her even in her waywardness. And God comes to us and he redeems us in our waywardness. And he portrays us as images of his grace, trophies of his mercy, but yet he doesn't leave us like that. Slowly, slowly by divine power, the flower begins to bloom again. That's sanctification. It begins to work. And yeah, there's, there, there's, that's a struggle, and that is quite the arduous process. 
as we mortify sin, as we submit to the Spirit, as he works his grace in us. But there is coming a day when we die. And for the believer, death is not the end. Death is a doorway. It's a passage, truly. And we see that. Okay, we, we, we hear it every Easter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. But Paul was quoting the Bible, which Paul was apt to do. And what does he do here? What does he say? Verse 14. Shall I, shall I redeem these flowers? Shall I display these flowers? Shall I redeem, ransom my people, wayward and corrupt and idolatrous from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O oh, death, where are your plagues? O oh, Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden in my eyes. The people are going, what is he talking about? And they would never fully understand it, but we do. That's why, that's why the writer of Hebrews would say that we're better off than the Old Testament saints. Not because we're more saved than they were, but because we have a greater revelation. We have seen the majesty of Messiah himself, Christ Jesus, come. Yes, sir. And Jesus died for us. Jesus became the wilted, diseased flowers. He took idolatry and he took our, our sin, our iniquity upon himself. We know this. Your idleness, your apathy, which you hate, you're like, oh, I don't relate this. God hates it a lot more than you do. And yet Jesus became that on the cross. He became your lust. He became your pride for all of his people. And he died. So he covered that. He absorbed the wrath of God. And he covered transgression. But he did not stay dead. And so that he can rise for our liberation. That's what it means for us. We have this assurance. Uh, Sophia saying this morning, whose resurrection means I'll rise. Jesus' resurrection means I'll rise. Amen. Like Jesus, like him coming back from the tomb isn't just for him. It's not just an example. Hey, when you die, if you, if you want to bad enough, you can come back. No, it's that when you die, you're in the ground and you're gone and there's only condemnation waiting for your soul. But through Christ, crucified for transgression and risen again, not only is he coming back, but we come back with him. So the video here is not just a picture of wilted flowers. The video is of wilted, damaged, broken flowers return to vitality and beauty and life. The resurrection says to us that this is not it. It's not only is all this bad stuff gonna end, but all this bad stuff is gonna be rewound. Amen. It's gonna be set right. So the disease that ravages your body will not only be gone, but you'll be fully restored to the place pre-fall that I intended my people to walk in. Because Jesus died in my place. Yes, sir. We look at death today and we say, truly, if we understand this, disease, destruction, death, do your worst. It's all you can do. We have hope. Amen. Not in us, because we're Israel. We have hope in the one who says, I am the only God. And apart from me, there is no other Savior. Let's pray.